Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Bartholomew Ryan. I'm assistant curator here at The Walker um, in the visual arts department. Um, and uh, this is, uh, it's really nice to have you all here, particularly in the print study room, which is where we normally um, meet for acquisitions and other meetings like that. So um, this is a much less formal atmosphere, I hope, and um, I'm looking forward to you know, the conversation. Um, Justin's work, um, th how many people here actually know Justin have, or have met him? So, okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> so, so Justin's a photographer, you know, who's obviously been working for, for a number of years now um, uh, and has produced uh, probably three major um, uh, projects, historical, marker, axis, and allies, and then most recently, um, Northern Studies. Uh, and the Walker acquired a portfolio from the Northern Studies um, uh, exhibition or, or project, uh, which you can see up here. And um, did, did everybody get a chance to look at it and spend a little bit of time with it? Um, maybe, maybe we should just take a few minutes now to walk around and just, if you haven't seen it, just, just, t just have Do a look. That. Yeah, <laughs> so you know what we're talking about later, yeah. <laughs> In some ways, and we'll get to this, this, this body of work is slightly unusual um, in Justin's oeuvre, although maybe not, but, um, but obviously it kind of fits into some of the themes that arise in, in Exposed, for those of you who've seen the exhibition. And I'll just ask one more question. Has everybody seen Exposed or, yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, Justin's a, a photographer, and I thought I would ju just start the conversation by actually just um, exploring, you know, um, your thoughts about the exhibition and you know what work resonated for you and so on and then we can go into this body of work and sort of where it came from and what it emerged from and hopefully that'll lead into some other questions and feel free to you know contribute at any point if people have something to say and then towards the end I'll also just ask people if they have any questions for Justin or so yeah all right. Well, um, you know, as far as the, the exhibition goes, um, we were talking earlier about it. Um, I kind of come to, uh, I guess, the, the, the exhibition with, with two hats, one as an artist and another as, um, as an educator. And when, I'm, when I go to that show in particular, I think, um, one of the things that I'm struck by is how it is such a good show for um, looking at the history of the medium in a way. It starts out, you know, um, relatively early in the medium, um, talking about, uh, you know, with, with early works that, that kind of deal with the kind of voyeuristic nature of, of the medium. And from its inception, it was you know, used in that way um, uh, right off the bat. And so it's a great show in the sense that you get to um, sort of see this progression and all these different strategies and all these different ways that it relates directly to, um, uh, you know, this idea of, of it being this kind of voyeuristic um, uh, thing. Um, and so, what, what's also striking about it, just from an artist's perspective, is that um, it's, it's kind of refreshing to see so many kind of disparate ways of working. Mm -hmm. And also, for me as, a, as an artist, just knowing the fact that I enjoy so many of them. Um, and, uh, and there's some pretty kind of important uh, pieces in the in the the show actually that are that are you know pretty significant within the history of the medium, and then others that are more kind of maybe not as well known and maybe kind of delve into a territory that's a little different. But um, but for me, it's just really wonderful to be able to see a lot of the kind of various approaches to the medium and and also just knowing that my response to it frequently is like, wow, I really like this work. I forgot about mm. this, you know? Because a lot of it, it's, it's, it's work that I'm familiar with, but I haven't maybe visited it in a, in a long while. So um, it gets you kind of, gets the wheels turning as it, as it were. So um, for me, that's, that's been one of the main kind of pleasures of the, of the work itself. Mm. So yeah. Uh, one of the things that sort of strikes you when you look at the exhibition is, um, 
is how much photography is embedded in power relations in a way, how the image um, uh, is, is just um, so, um, so much used in sort of different contexts to sort of affirm or um, subvert uh, various you know, dogmas or, or positions. Um, and I think of you know, from um, the, uh, you know, the, the electro electrocution image to the race riots to, um, uh, to other sort of more um, uh, sexually explicit or uh, um, sexually, uh, I guess, What's the word? Charged, charged, <laughs> <laughs> liberated, or uh, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and and you know it's it's something that that I'm going to get to with your work a little bit, but but this idea of of the kind of the actual the sort of the the power relations embedded in photography is something that in this exhibition is very sort of clear, um, but then in other sort of branches of photography might not be as explicit, but I think is often still there, and I'm thinking of um, the new uh, topographics, uh, sort of, you know, landscape photography, um, um, and which is very much a kind of tradition that you uh, relate to in your mm -hmm, work, mm -hmm. um, where identity or the, the body or the person or, you know, is not so forward, but very much a kind of a sense of landscape and place. Um, and, uh, you know, we could sort of actually just segue right now into into northern studies and then sort of come back and relate that to the exhibition a little bit and to to photography in general would you like to do that yeah that? yeah sure yeah. so you want me to talk about the 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 project northern studies yeah. itself so why don't you just just talk about where you know how it emerged and and some of the, so yeah. so the project for for those of you this is this is a, it's a funny project for me in a, in a way because there it does require a certain amount of exposition to like kind of let you know what you're looking at or or, or whatever, which I, some might see as a failure, but um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you can be the judge of that. But um, uh, the project itself is loosely based off of a 1967 audio documentary that um, the famous Canadian uh, pianist Glenn Gould made um, kind of after he had sort of retired from performing. He became sort of obsessed with with radio and the the kind of intricacies of it and the possibilities that were involved in it. And really, I think he just wanted to stay away from the stage. And it was like this kind of cocoon of an environment that he could, could sort of delve into. Um, but at any rate, um, the, the um, radio documentary that he makes is uh, Something that I just immediately, when I when I read about it and thought about it, thought, oh my gosh, this is something that would be very interesting to use as kind of a departure point to work on a, a larger project. And 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 the gist of the of the um, of it goes like this: it he basically takes a train from. Winnipeg to the northernmost terminus of the Canadian Rail, which is in Churchill, which most people I think are familiar with because it's um, a uh, of its position now as like the polar bear capital of the world. So like anytime anytime you see like polar bear on National Geographic specials, they're usually filmed in Churchill because it's relatively. Um, easy to access compared to some of the other places where they, they exist. And so at any rate, he takes this um, train. Um, and the only way that you can get there um, is by rail or by plane. And Glenn Gould was terrified of flying. Um, and so he obviously took the train. Um, I, I guess you could um, canoe down some rivers and things like that and eventually get to Hudson Bay. But, um, uh, you you take this train and it's still in existence today. And when I when I was thinking about it, I was like, oh my god, I've got to get on this train and and like do this. And so, you know, went up there and tried to figure out what kind of pictures I was going to make or whatever. But his project, he interviews five different uh, people who live in the Canadian North, and he basically is interviewing them um, and. It is them ruminating on what it means to be in the Canadian North, or just the North specifically, and what is the kind of idea of this place. And he takes the voices, the, the, the various people he interviews, and he weaves them in a way that it becomes almost like a musical score. Um, and 
um, it's both fascinating and frustrating in parts because some certain times you know all five people are speaking at once and you can't discern anything and at other points a voice will kind of rise out of the the din and and then there'll be maybe two voices kind of going and sometimes they they reinforce one another and other times they um, uh, contradict one another and and the piece kind of becomes a uh a map of the North, which isn't just sort of about place, but it's about sort of you know social, emotional, psycho, kind of geographic thinking, and everybody has a different take on on different aspects. Some people are glorifying it, other people are really sort of down on it. But it becomes almost like, a, if you like, to universalize it, some kind of portrait of the human condition or something. You know, what is it to be in this place that is so isolated and yet is not innocent, has, has this history of subjugation of First Nations people and so on. And th th that kind of feedback loop is very prevalent in, in the piece when you listen to it, you know? But yeah, um, yeah. yeah. yeah so, so then I decided to try to make pictures of this and uh, went up there first. My first visit took all these horrible pictures on the train um, that I never used because they were really not very interesting, and then um, had to find a way of using or thinking about. I wanted the structure to have have the connection to the Gould piece, and so what I eventually came up with was the idea of a substitute for the actual narrators. I would find five kind of discrete subjects that were up there that weren't people but had very particular narratives to them. So there was the town of Churchill itself. There was the this kind of idea of ecotourism and in particular a series of these kind of white out, you know, kind of liminal pictures of of these tundra buggies roaming around looking for polar bears. Um, uh, there's all this um, Canadian and American kind of Cold War era um, uh, uh, communications research that was being done with rockets and stuff because they were worried about uh, ballistic missiles from the Soviet Union. And so there's all this like kind of, you know, Cold War trash all over the place up there, as it were. And then um, these. Uh, uh, spruce that kind of venture out onto the tundra um, and are stunted and, and show the, the, the kind of physical presence of weather and they're very anthropomorphic and, and so I photographed those. And then um, finally, and the piece that is related I think most directly with the show out here, this um, uh, site where the Canadian government in um, uh, the 60s uh, resettled uh, a small band of Native Americans called the Dene, and they were nomadic. And this is what's interesting about this to me is that, you know, this was this was the 60s, not you know the 1800s or even the early 1900s. This was like you know the it not so distant past. The year they moved to that town was the same year Glenn Gould made his his idea of his doc town. yeah. And it's interesting because there are hints about the the kind of things that were going on with the Canadian government and and uh, Native Americans or First Nation peoples how is how um, I, I think it gets referred to more often in, in uh, Canada and um, and basically the site where they relocated them they just had a complete social collapse because they're there was nothing for them to do. There was no way for them to sustain themselves. I mean, there's there's literally nothing up there for, for anybody to do unless you were, you know, being nomadic and going around and 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 moving and and you know working working in that way, or else you'd have to work for the. Um, there's a port up there, and and so they basically just devolved into this horrible cycle. Of, of social breakdown with alcoholism and and um, you know just basically you know the story we've all heard a million times before but it's just so kind of contemporary I guess in a way or, or modern that it just to me is very kind of 
frightening. Um, and the way I found out about it, I, I, I'd done some research on it, but uh, a, a person who was actually on the train gave me this, this um, book, which is basically a, 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 a story about the, the relocation. And it's just brutal. Um, and so what I, I knew that that was something that had to feed into the, this kind of idea of this place. And so I sought out this area. They had relocated them twice, but they, the second time, they actually built concrete foundations and built actual houses for them. But of course, they were kind of on the, are always sort of marginalized on the outskirts of town. And in the hierarchy of native peoples in, in Canada, they were like the, the lowest of the rung, you know? And, um, and so they had this problem where they originally were, and so they moved them to this other place, built them, you know, this little village, and, um, you know, within a few years, it just, like, it was already going in the wrong direction, but it just completely broke down. And, and over a third of them within a few years um, perished kind of untimely deaths. And in the, in the book, the description of many of those stories is just kind of, it's it's brutal. I guess I don't know how else to describe it. But the the book is an oral history project, so it's actually witnesses who were, you know people who were there just just talking it through and so on. But so so you went to the village, and part of the idea was to to make it one of these sort of sort of characters, as it were. So yeah. you, would, you would photograph it. But so far within the series, there's no there's no people. There are no. no it, and and that yeah. was a conscious decision. You know, one of the things I I wanted to stay away from was. I thought the obvious thing for me to do would be to like take my camera up there and go photograph idiosyncratic people in the north, you know. Um, and I didn't want to go down that route. I, I thought that was just, it, it could be interesting, but it, it just, it wasn't going to be interesting enough to sustain me. And I'm always, um, I guess I'd never, uh, th that way of working sometimes I, I kind of shy away from. Um, because I feel like it gives you maybe a false sense of the place. And so I wanted to stay away from that kind of individual kind of thing. And so uh, I chose these subjects. And, and my way of photographing, I mean, I consider myself probably, you know, I mean, I think of myself just as a photographer and artist. But I mean, it is true that the vast majority of my work is concerned with the landscape um, on some level. And so these are essentially kind of landscape pictures. But so I came to this site to photograph, and I knew I wanted, I was, I'm always looking for something, and it, it can take me in any direction. And I also knew as I was making the pictures that I did want and need something that was going to throw it in a, in a slightly different way. And so I went to the site. And initially, I was like, oh, I'm going to take these pictures of these concrete foundations. And most of you saw there was the one picture at the end down here of one of the foundations that still kind of lays there. And that's the actual site where um, I actually had a, um, a friend with me who was my, my bear guard um, who had a, you know, a shotgun with slugs in it. And when I would get under my dark cloth and make a picture, he'd be like out there protecting me, um, as it were. So but of course, he wasn't is, doing that. Um, <laughs> well, he, Justin works with a, with a 4 by 5 sort of field camera. So that's, you know, to take a photograph, he has to get under this black sort of thing. And, um, and you know, it, you can be very vulnerable in that landscape yeah, if you're yes. sort of distracted. Although the yeah. bears were not the significant thing, really. It was the bugs. Um, uh, that's a whole other topic. Uh, but um, I mean, you had to, you ha yeah no unfortunately I had to wear a I had gloves and a and a um, net over my head um, and then like a hundred percent deed on every like part that was exposed um, and it was like the boundary waters times ten in terms of the the bugs um, and I do I actually later on I can show a video that you can see them it's kind of insane but so as I was there the initial thing was like, well, the obvious thing to do here is to photograph the, the foundations. And maybe I'll kind of take this sort of, uh, you know, kind of um, typological approach where I'll just photograph each one of these. You know, there's probably 70 of these, these foundations. 
And they're interesting. There's, there's remnants of what has happened there. And, and I started making those pictures. But um, when I was there, the guy who was supposed to be protecting me started wandering around um, and stumbled upon right um, a, a few feet away from one of the foundations in a, in a ditch a package of meticulous, something that was wrapped meticulously in a, um, these kind of heavy duty trash bags with duct tape. And it looked like, you know, a couple, two or three big um, stacks of yellow pages or phone books or something like that. And so obviously curiosity, you know, ensued. And it was like, should we open this? Yeah, yeah. But it was, it, there was actually a fair amount of consternation because because having read that, this was one of the first places I've ever photographed where I felt like there was an aspect, not so much of me trespassing, but I needed to think about what I was doing here. Um, I was haunted by some of the things that had happened there. And so it was just like, there was, there was that always kind of going on in the back of my mind. So opening it, wasn't just like it, it actually took a little bit of like, eh, you know, so, but eventually curiosity, you know, won out and we opened it up and it was somebody's private pornographic stash of breast fetish pornography, um, which somebody said to me, a friend of mine was like, isn't all pornography breast, <laughs> you know, or into, you know, and I was like, well, these are different. Um, uh, and and uh, and they they were they were they were some of them and and you can see in some of the pictures up there there's almost like a cartoon like representation of that and and but what was so interesting about it was that many of the images and the images that are in the portfolio and they were they were eight by ten prints right they, oh yeah, yeah they weren't conventional um, like magazines, magazines. Yeah. they were. Uh, eight by ten glossies, so actual C prints, so real color photographs, and the freeze thaw cycle had gotten to them. I think they'd maybe been there ten or fifteen years, and um, uh, it it had gotten water had gotten in there, and basically all the dyes had seeped away except for the cyan, which is also the most stable of the mm -hmm. of the dyes, and so they had this kind of glowing sort of haunted quality to them. They looked like they were in ice or, you know, and, and they were wet. So there was, there was just all this kind of thing going on. And then, of course, like the kind of nature, the perverse nature of the place that I was photographing in and then the perverse nature of these pictures, I was like, oh my God, this is like crazy. And uh, so, and I, you know, I was like, I should, I should, I need to take pictures of these. And I knew instantly, actually, after we had gone through a bunch of them, I knew that I had found the, the thing that I needed to kind of throw the work in the direction that I wanted it to go. And um, the only camera I had was this four by five. So I just set it up and literally would just lay the pictures out on the, on the gravel and the ground. And then it, you know focus and take a picture with a four by five sheet of film, which was a little bit ridiculous because I I mean you know I could have easily brought them back and scanned them or done something, but I didn't want to take them away from that place and um, and they also I mean the, the they smelled bad, which was really weird. The odor was one of the things that. It was the kind of thing that would make you sick to your stomach, and I don't know if it was the chemistry or just the deterioration of, you know, uh, organic material because it's it's in like all of northern Manitoba is like a big bog, um, and so it it has kind of a stench to it in certain areas. Um, so I started photographing these these pictures, um, and I actually we only I only had a few sheets of film left, and I had to catch a plane then uh and and so we had to pack up and go so we wrapped them back up and put them back and we came back the next year and i photographed the rest of them so there was a, there was a literally a full year's time mm. where they were they were sitting there and of course when i got home i was like oh my god what if those things leave like what is going to happen you know but sure enough they were they were there um 
And so, um, so it was around 200, right? But you, yeah. you it, edited it down to? To 10, and I, I, there's a number more, but the ones that I, I chose for the portfolio seem to both kind of run the gamut of the different sort of expressions of the way that the, the women were treated in the pictures. And then also, um, I was interested in the pictures that were the most ambiguous, in a way. Um, because if they're, if they're so explicit that you, you just instantly recognize what you're looking at, um, I, I feel like you lose that connection to the place and to this kind of haunted quality of, of some of the, the, the mm. uh, you know, the pictures. Did you re-photograph any of the ones that you encountered the first time a year later? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. There was definitely a few that I, that I photographed over again, um, and, uh, but they look the same. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And th these images have a sort of, uh, you know, I mean, you were explaining before how some of them you could actually see, you know, actual grapefruits in them and so on. It was never, it, it was almost like just the intimation of this idea of like having, you know, really large breasts that, yeah. that was, that was the function rather than actually literally being that, which is, um, you know, just interesting because you don't get that from maybe looking at those images. But um, one of the things that you know, because they situate themselves very differently in terms of the history of photography, and one is, you know, um, re-photography, like mm -hmm. Richard Prince, or, you know, a lot of yeah, different yeah. sort of um, gestures. And I, I've always sort of felt, that personally, with photography, and this is, you know, that, that it is, you know, you are, there is something in there. You know, you have captured something, and it's sort of frozen, and it's in this moment, and, and, and there's a kind of a, you can call it, you're stealing it or you're preserving it or whatever, but there is, it's not, you know, just paper and chemicals. There's actually something there. And um, so for me, you know, with someone like Richard Prince or so on, I, I often feel this kind of sense of like just the kind of re-objectification frequently of the female form or various other things. And uh, with you, with this series, there's, this kind of movement into disintegration of sort of pulling apart, it almost like releases, and this is not a very curatorial language, but it kind of almost <laughs> releases this very, this kind of psychic kind of, liber, you know, liberation, like movement away from that moment of being fixed and being placed and being controlled and, and all of those things. And, and I wonder if you understand it in that way. To me, like it feels like there's something quite, quite um, a sort of profound about, about what is happening to those images over time, but. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea that they aren't fixed, that they do, they, and they're on their way to disappearing, you know, they will disappear. Because um, uh, I put them back again, um, you know, in a matter of time, they will, that, that will be, be gone. Then, of course, there's the irony that I've kind of, again, re-preserved re, re them. Um, and that's where the nasty photographer comes <laughs> yeah, in. Exactly. Is, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm not totally letting them go and have their, have their peace. Um, and uh, so, you know, the idea of the breakdown of them is definitely, I mean, it's, you know, it's connected to the place as well. So there's just, there's, there's so many, so many kind of, and one of the things I, I knew when I found them was that there were just all these kind of interesting layers that were, that were going on there. They also look like cyanotypes. Um, mm. So there's like this connection to a, a particular process. But then also the, like the deeply sort of private, sort of obsessive nature of, of photography as a collection and mm. then sometimes as photographers and sort of what they pursue. I mean, the idea, so to be clear, like these photographs, you know, we, we think they're mail order sort of photographs that, you know, people, and, and that they were, you know, they, they come after the Saize Dene actually left and escaped that village and resettled um, um, some grounds further north and so on. So it's not like they're linked to the Saize Dene sort of no. in an explicit way. Somebody up there basically used that as, I assume his, but we, we yeah, have yeah, a yeah, stash, you know, and we'd probably drive out there and well, sort of collect them. And, and, and that's part of the interest too, is like, why are they there? Like, right. they're, like, if you if you go there, like the landscape stretches on for miles and miles. Why this spot? Mm. Why, you know, um, 
is that I mean, there's a perversity there. I mean, I guess you could drive there, and there aren't a lot of roads. Um, so, and there there aren't a lot of people visiting. You know, this this place. Uh, it's not on the tourism map uh, mm. of Canada. Um, but uh, so yeah, I mean, I was I was I was very kind of curious as to like why they were there, and also like yeah, like you know, did this person really have an intention of coming back and getting them? Were they hidden? Were they, you know, so there was all these things. And I think, you know, and maybe I'm jumping the gun here, but the biggest connection for me with these pictures and the exposed show is not that, I mean, because voyeurism is, I think, normally connect, like if you look up the strict definition, is connected to a, a, a sort of looking that is sexual in nature. And obviously pornography fits the bill for that, but it's, it's usually when the person isn't aware that they're being watched um, uh, and that you're looking at something that's private and, and not designed for you, the viewer. Whereas pornography is, there's this, there's this relationship between the person being photographed and the person photographing and then the person who's consuming it later on or whatever. Um, but that doesn't seem voyeuristic to me. What was voyeuristic was the fact that I was stumbling upon somebody else's personal mm. belongings. And that was the part where the voyeurism ent entered. It was like I was entering in somebody's kind of own private collection. And that was voyeuristic. Well, you were um, a voyeur of a voyeur. Yes, exactly. And, and, yeah. and that, that was, um, you know, and that, and that's where, I mean, and and you know, when we were photographing them, when I was photographing them, there, you know, I definitely had that sense of not doing something that I necessarily shouldn't, but being like, wow, I'm this is this isn't mine, you know, this mm. is this is somebody else's, and and then of course there, I mean, there's all kinds of ethical questions that could be asked, um, uh, which. I tossed around in my head, but of course, you know, ended up where, where we are now. Um, <laughs> Could you tell whether the package had been opened before you opened it? Yeah, it definitely hadn't. Yeah. No, it it was oh. it was, it was sealed. Oh, so and was it addressed right. to anyone? No. So there was probably no. something somebody used somewhere else and then needed to get rid of for a while. Yeah, you know, maybe the or wanted to get rid of and didn't want didn't want to bring to the dump. I mean, there could be so many yeah, reasons. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it is weird. It's like, well, why wouldn't you just throw it in your trash bin and then nobody would probably shame, see it. just pure shame. Yeah, well, it could be, and and it could be that they wanted to get rid of it, but not really get rid of it. You know, <laughs> I mean. So there's there. I mean, I the speculation can like go on for for a long time. Um, yeah. yeah. Like how big can you just like go like this? Yeah, I was like, I would say like, like that. Yeah, and then they're but they're eight by ten, just single images. Boom, 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 boom. You know, and they were stuck together. So sometimes you'd pull them apart, and they would actually disintegrate. Like they just, and some of the images are actually a, a an image that they the back of a photo oh, that was through. ghosting through onto another one. So, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes then there would be two images that would be floating on top of one another. So there was, it, it was interesting mm -hmm. to, to see how that, you know, kind of, kind of played out. So, um, but so, so to pull back from that a little bit and we mm -hmm. can go back into it later, maybe when we, um, the, <clears throat> so, in the exposed exhibition, you know, there's a lot of um, you know surveillance style photographs, uh, uh, voyeuristic um, ones that sort of have an obsessive nature in terms of who the photographer was and what they were um, pursuing and so on. Um, and a lot of it, you know, the the curator situates a lot of it in in terms of like the the handheld uh, camera, that sort of innovation in the 1880s where people could actually sort of carry cameras around, and that's where surveillance and a lot of you know the casual sort of frank sort of photograph comes from. Um, or sort of dates from that period and, and moves forward. But, um, but there's another sort of tradition in photography, which I've sort of alluded to before, um, uh, that is not sort of so, uh, you know, obviously sort of subjective in terms of either the desire of the photographer or, um, or else some kind of way in which the camera sort of captures the, the, the image, which is more 
sort of neutral, mm -hmm. um, um, which is often not based on sort of sort of people and um, in a direct way. And you know, in the contemporary sort of photography, or it probably came most of the four or with new topographics photographs of a man altered landscape. You know, the legendary 1975 exhibition at the George Eastman House and. You know, I know you would probably not be comfortable sort of situating yourself yeah, sort of too no, much within I'm, that tradition. Yeah, but you, yeah. your first project was you following the Lewis and Clark Trail, going going west with you know your four by five, right, and documenting the landscape. And that's your next project, Axis and Allies. You embedded yourself with a Nazi uh, reenactment uh, troop here in Minnesota. Uh, um, and would photograph them, but there I actually often... was with the Russians because I. Are you with the Russians? I wasn't. I, wasn't, I thought it was. No, no. I w well, I wasn't comfortable God. putting on that outfit. <laughs> That's so, really weird. yeah. What yeah, did I think? yeah, yeah. yeah, he was yeah. The and it was expensive to do that too. So there was like both right. of those things. So at the, any rate, <laughs> the Nazi uniform was more expensive. Yes, more expensive and more difficult to get. Right. But even in those photographs where you have people, it's very much this kind of, the, they, they almost seem inscribed within, within the landscape again. And so I kind of wanted to sort of, sort of step away from Exposed for a minute and talk about that kind of tradition within photography and then maybe, maybe try and locate the identity in it or try and locate the, some of these themes that exist in Exposed within that kind of work because I think it's, it's there. It's just there in a very different way. Um, or... What do you, how do you respond? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think um, certainly my generation of, of photographers who went to art school in the, in the 90s and, and um, that new topographics way of working and thinking was one of the sort of two or three kind of central ways of, of kind of thinking about making work in the, within the medium of photography. And it cast a long shadow and I certainly, there's a, there's a almost like a slack jawed kind of dumb way of making the picture where you just take the camera, place it somewhere and it just transcribes what's in front of it. And there's a beauty in that and a, and a kind of, more objective way of looking at things, but of course, that's really not the case. I mean, there's you're always excluding things out of the frame and putting certain things in, and um, and so it does get at this kind of slippery nature of photography. Like, even can it be objective or or whatever? So there's there's that kind of aspect to it, and my I think my approach is also like. In some ways, I feel like my generation, that that approach makes a lot of sense too. I don't know why. I, I guess I haven't really thought about it that much. But there's something about this kind of very matter-of-fact way of making a picture, where you're not trying to put like some you know crazy lights or stage something or or whatever. Where it's just this very much like this is here. This is it. And you know, there's enough to go on here right. for you to think about it. You I mean, know? that deadpan quality, and also, you know, often highly composed at the same time. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's not you know, a, uh, you know, sort of like a handheld sort of camera frequent. Well, I mean, sometimes it is, but yeah. mostly it's not. Uh, it feels like you know, there's an appeal there because it steps away from the, the old. Uh, that old problem of sort of popular culture and sort of manipulation of, of uh, the subject through you know uh, reality television or uh, highly sentimental you know soap operas or just whatever you want to put it that, that yeah. there's a kind of a way in which this work has appeal uh, particularly within the contemporary art world because it sort of steps back from sort of immediate immediate sort of accessibility and and so on and yet it's a very everyday sort of representation of something but it it. You know, when William Jenkins wrote his um, his essay on the show originally, the curator of the New Topographics show, he talked about it in terms of stylistic anonymity, where the person or the individual or the identity is receding from what you're you're actually seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm going to probe that a little okay. because <laughs> I, I was watching this video a few days ago of Catherine Opie, who, who you know is a big admirer of that show, and of course her work is very sort of identity forward in lots of ways. And she was talking about when she was a graduate student, she did this project called um, the Master Plan, which was about 
the, this master plan construction of Valencia in, in California. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was very much about, you know, just, just seeing something being built and looking at just this kind of very uh, almost banal sort of detritus of like sort of quasi suburban, you know, life and so on. And she said that her, some of her teachers were like, you know, challenging her saying, you know, Catherine, this isn't queer work, you know, and for her, she was like, well, it, well, it is because it's all about, you know, it's called I'm the master plan. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is a, a master plan for construction. It's all about exclusion, which is what the suburbs were for me growing up or, um, so in other words, if you're gonna, if, if you're gonna practice a photography that's about identity and self-representation, it doesn't have to be just the body. You can take it out into topo topography, you know, landscape, and so on. And um, I'm going to ask you a very direct <laughs> yeah, <laughs> question. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but you know, for for me, those new topographic photographers, you know, they're they're mainly men, and you know, sort of generally sort of associated with sort of. Um, I mean, most of them would you know identify as straight and so yeah. on. And you know, you're a gay photographer who works within that that tradition to a degree, and. So, so do you see a sort of a, a certain politics, or do you see your identity as being somehow Im, Im, important, or almost like v visible, or, or made important for the work, or is that something that you feel is sort of separate? Um, I, I think that it's present in the in the project where I photographed these World War II reenactors the most because there I'm actually going in and hanging out with a whole group of people and there is a certain kind of just kind of dudeness to to uh to that whole thing that um except with the nazis yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> um uh, that was uh well and there's there is all kinds of pageantry involved with those uniforms right that is that is about power and has, I mean, I mean, there's all kinds of connections that people fetishize that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, the other work, for me, it's more, it's, it's, I don't even know if it's necessarily a subtext, although um, I think it's there, but it's really quiet, <laughs> if that makes sense. Mm. I mean, for me, going out and making pictures in the world, particularly if I'm going out into these kind of far away or rural spaces, I, I'm very aware of, of my um, sexuality in a way. Not, not about my sexuality in the fact that I can't just be like, oh, I've got to give my partner a call right now. Or, or you know, like there has to be, there's a certain kind of me Hold, withholding things um, that maybe makes me maneuver through the landscape a little bit differently. Um, but it's also something that's very easy to hide, you know? So it's not, it's not like, uh, I don't feel like it's that, that sort of difficult. But I do think I've always had an interest in these journeys that, uh, people make that are generally kind of thought of as these kind of masculine kind of things like going to the Canadian North is not like something, you know, that, I mean, it's, it, I mean, I, th I think it was predominantly men uh, in terms of Caucasians, certainly, or mm -hmm. Anglos going North, that's what it was, you know. And then you have Lewis and Clark. Yeah, and Lewis and Clark, and then the, or you the, know. the the reenactors. Re yeah, right? and so there is always this very kind of masculine. I actually once um, was talking to somebody who all of a sudden in the conversation, like in the middle of it, just was like, wait, are you gay? And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and he's like, "Wow, I just, I, your picture, you're, I just didn't think that that. It was almost like it was like I, you weren't. It wasn't possible for a, a gay man to make these pictures, which yeah. is just preposterous and strange. But and uh -huh. this guy was not. I mean, he was, he was, he was just. It was, it was funny. Um, but I, uh, I, uh, and I was like, yeah, you know, and 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 there is that subtext in the pictures. But you know, I think in this work. It's, it's not, and it's also funny because I'm, I'm following somebody who, while I, I believe Glenn Gould is, it was, was straight, I mean, there was a certain amount of questioning of his sexuality and of his, like, 
just who this guy who was. was he? And he yeah. certainly was not the typical like explorer. But I think part of his interest in the North stemmed from that same area of like, wow, I'm really kind of, this is an area that I'm just not really comfortable in or know that much about or, or um, mm. but am still fascinated by or drawn to. And he was also very kind of patriotic in a way, I think. Yeah. And so there was that kind of aspect to it. But I'm digressing. I don't know where I'm going. Well, I, I, you know, I don't want to as ascribe this to your sexuality. It could be any number of factors. But you know, I, I wrote a text about your work once, and I used probably an awful phrase, like that you have this lyr <laughs> lyrical, political sensibility. Like, you know, there's, there is something very, and you know, this is true of a lot of actually the new topographic yeah, photographers. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the, and again, I, I'm not suggesting you are yeah, one. Yeah, I'm yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Um, but but there was something about the title of that 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 series, you know, that that journey up to to Manitoba, the way you called it, Northern Studies, which kind of brought with it this kind of whole anthropological sort of history of of you know sort of control and of you know of um, that comes with. I mean, it's it's actually a whole academic area, you know. Um, uh, but but the 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 th the thing that comes through in Gould's work and 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 yours in a very different way is that this is a really uh, you know, a highly sort of contested sort of sort of space that uh, has had successive layers and, and years of sort of deliberations made about it by people from outside who are constantly trying to deal with like, you know, the Indian problem or the this or that. So you have fur traders followed by, you know, other kind of generations of people who, who are who are coming there and who are always sort of like coming up with new ways to solve, you know, the problems. And um, I wanted to and I, I thought you kind of calling it that was sort of acknowledging that sort of history and situating photography and, and your project within within that in a way that through sort of acknowledging it was was almost, if you like, um, giving you a little bit of, of space to, to, to make that, to do that kind of thing, which, which is in a tradition of yet another person moving there and coming back with some sort of like statements or, or mm -hmm. whatever. But um, I, w I wanted to, to show this photograph because, you know, just to get back to the Saizi Dene, and maybe I'll pass it around, but um, this is a photograph from Duck Lake in 1952. And it was, it was taken by, you know, people who were associated with them, um, with the department in the Canadian government that sort of decided Indian affairs. And um, uh, it's a photograph of the caribou who have been um, slaughtered on, on a lakeside. And they're left there sort of lying in, in, in this pile. And it's, it's an image that could be very at home and exposed, actually. Mm -hmm. But um, but w what's fascinating about it is that it was used to propel a whole new sort of policy towards the north. And ultimately, it was what allowed the Seizi Dene to be forcibly removed from their hunting grounds because the idea was these people are out of control, they're just killing indiscriminately, this is like slaughter, blah, blah, blah. Uh, whereas actually this is part of a long history of, you know, you can only get so many of these things a year and when you shoot, when you kill them, you kill as many as you can and then it freezes over and then through the year you go back to that space and you dig them up and you use their hides and you eat them and you know it's a very simple thing but it was you it was published in a, in a newspaper in Canada and it became this kind of huge cause celebre like look at what these people are doing and so in a way you know I'm just bringing this back to photography and exposed but this is a the image is an incredibly powerful thing and yeah then, and it's yeah. super slippery right I mean right. like the meaning like you 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 put a, a, a somebody describing it as like this kind of indiscriminate killing of and not using all the the animals and so on and so forth it can it's so easy it, it shows so much but tells you so little you know and that's kind of just the nature of photography which is also why I, I love it as a as a medium because it is this it's this contradictory thing of like yeah it shows you everything but it doesn't tell you anything and and that's and, and so it can be used as a tool in all kinds of different ways and sometimes, you know, and to horrible outcomes, um, uh, you know, and, and that's a good example of, of that. Um, mm. so, it strikes me yeah. that um, unlike the Canadian newspapers, you're not commenting on the cache of pornographic images of women which has its parallel to the pile of caribou. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
It seems like you are deliberately refraining from saying this was a horrible thing. You mean the 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 pornography or the or the resettlement? The pornography itself. Yeah, I'm. I wasn't commenting on the, the pornography itself. Um, and partly, I think, because I think people already have very specific feelings about that. And, and um, I have my own. And you know, there's, there's the, I mean, you know, the objectification of these people and what power do they have in the picture making process and so on and so forth. But I, I, yeah, I was much more interested in the connection to the, the actual space in which they were found um, uh, and, and drawing kind of a parallel or a metaphor between the way these, these things, the nature of them, you know, um, and the perversity of them. Uh, and there is a certain, you know, and again, it was just literally, they look like they're figures embedded and are ensconced in ice and they're fading away and they had this kind of ghostly quality. Um, and that felt like it was right in tune with the nature of the, the space that I was photographing. Um, Have you uh, exhibited with the old uh, soundtrack? Um, no, uh, yeah, well, yes. Um, there was in the exhibition space. There was a uh, two like iPods that were set up with uh, headphones so that you could go over and listen to it. Um, I'm not sure if that was the most successful way to kind of integrate that in there, um, but it did provide some kind of context for for what was going going on and i did i did think about like well what would happen if i like mounted speakers in here and i just don't know i don't know how that would turn out it might be too i think you'd become so aware of the voices that hmm. yeah i don't know it, it's 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 interesting i'm still not sure how i how i feel about that um what if it was just as new? Well, you mean, yeah, or yeah, like uh, him playing it at that. Um, it's interesting that you say that because some of the ancillary programming that they had surrounding the, the show, they had like a, a quartet come in and play and some Bach, and, you know. Um, and it actually was really wonderful. Um, it's recording the Goldberg variation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's that's what he's you know yeah most most well known for. So there there is, um, and I'm by no means a class, classical music aficionado. Um, but your boyfriend is. Yes, yeah, and that's how I, that's actually how I got the the or not that book, but a Gould biography that put me on this kind of whole path, <laughs> which is a whole other story. Mm. Um, so, did the original exhibition include other photographs of the site? It's just it's just the one picture to kind of ground the the series, you know. So the idea of it was so that these these um, images are were hanging on the wall and they're quite large. And I'll I'll show um, I can pass around some of the the pictures um, uh, from the from the book, but they were hanging on the wall. These kind of large pictures, and then actually off in another room was the the portfolio was sitting. And um, actually, I think ideally, what I wanted them to be doing was sitting in the middle of the gallery. And so you would sit down, and the portfolio case was there, and you could piece through them. And um, the idea was that you would be sitting there, and you'd be surrounded by all these images. And then you'd be kind of confronted with these, these kind of strange photographs. And that there would become like this dialogue between all these various kind of subjects I was shooting, um, and uh, and then um, and that would be kind of how how it operates. <laughs> it's so hard to look. And people, you know, after after we talk to, are welcome to go through and, mm -hmm. and kind of look at these, um, and uh, and kind of get an idea. And I have uh, some images too of the installation. That this I is it will just be too comical if you watch me do this. So I'm just yeah. going to leave it. <laughs> it's yeah, just yeah. big Why enough so that here? it's yeah, like a pain thinking. in the butt <laughs> to do it. Uh -huh. 
Um, so, uh, so I'll just yeah. open it on one page. So you can I don't know if that it. answered your question. Yeah, I was just trying to get an idea of what what else the exhibition included. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So it was you know probably about twenty images on a wall, and then this portfolio where these images, you know, um, you know, you had to sit down and actually page through them. And it was interesting because some people would come upon them, especially in the context of seeing the, this kind of these la beautiful landscape pictures. And then all of a sudden they'd be like, you, you could tell they were, they were intrigued. And then all of a sudden there was maybe a recognition of what, and a questioning of what they were looking at. That was, that was kind of interesting. Um, so that was kind of the, the, the nature of that. Um, and I did. I wanted the, these pictures to all interact with one another. And I knew that because these were the most, well, anomalous of the, of the group, that they would probably have the loudest voice. And they're also people. And by our very nature, I think we're more interested in, in human representations than mm. the landscape frequently. So, um, so that I knew that was going to kind of happen. And that was also a conscious decision to make them smaller and intimate. So you had to like deal with them differently. Too. Yeah, so if you, did you already say this, but if when you encountered this portfolio, it was something you, you had to go through. So it had that kind of private nature again, where, where you're sort of, it's just you and the, the image. The then. pictures, yeah. <laughs> so. um, going back to the, the topographical approach to mm -hmm. your photography, I'm, I'm wondering how, whether you see that as tied in at all to shooting with four by five? And whether, you know, if you loosened up, is, is it related to sort of like the slowness of the process and if it sure. lends itself to expansive view as opposed to, do you also shoot? I, 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 yeah, I mean like the, actually some of the whiteout images were shot with a medium format camera because I couldn't shoot with the 4x5 in that, in that I was in the back of this giant vehicle like outside taking these pictures and I had to, I had to have some maneuverability. But, the four by five, I think it does make you approach subject matter very differently because you have to go slowly. Um, and so there is this very kind of analytical setup that happens. I'm pretty quick at doing it now. Um, you see the thing reversed and it's upside down. But if you do it after a while, you, your, your brain actually learns how to flip it right side up, which is really crazy. You just, I don't look at the ground glass and think, oh, I'm looking at something that's upside down and reversed. It just, I, I picture it. So are right. we all upside down right now? Or <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly, there, exactly. You know, I'm not. Um, <laughs> thankfully, no, you would know that. Um, yeah. uh, 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 so, um, you know, but the, the main reason with the 4x5 that I like to shoot with it is because there's a descriptive power to the photograph that happens when you have this larger negative because there's so much information that's embedded in it. Um, and you also have the ability to blow something up and have a lot of detail that's still there before the picture starts to kind of break down. Um, but I am, am by no means dogmatic about like, oh, I have to shoot with the biggest camera, with the biggest film or something like that. Like I'm, I'm fine making pictures with you know, a little point and shoot too. If the subject matter is well suited to that, I would do that in a heartbeat. So I don't know if that answers it. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, could you uh, talk about the influence that other artists played in your representation of this packet? For example, Robert Heineken had work where he photographed. Um, magazines that were transparent, you could transparent mm -hmm. see through and you know, create this other image by the juxtaposi juxtaposition of two. Yeah. How do you see your work? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think one of the interesting things, because I'm an educator too, like, and, and I, it's like I'm so aware of the, the history of the medium and, um, and those who have preceded me, um, that, you know, I was very conscious, for instance, like when I started making those pictures of, there's the photographs from the um, um, Richard Misrock's Desert Canto series of the bullet riddled Playboy magazine um, that he like kind of photographed. And it was all about violence in the landscape. And, and you know, all, there, there was a way that that work, I, 
I was aware of the relationship of these pictures to that because I am photographing the landscape. And, um, and yeah, the Robert Heineken pictures, the most closely I you know, thought about them was the way that the picture would, you know, there would sometimes be two images transposed on the same kind of sheet of paper in this kind of ghostly way. And that was sort of what was going on in those images. So yeah, I mean, I was definitely aware of those, those things. And, you know, one of the things with the, the, the medium of photography is that it's, um, I was just watching a, a, a series of, of uh, the BBC did about photography and the, there's an interview with Chuck Close and he's talking about how it's the easiest um, medium to be competent at, but it's the most difficult to actually stamp your own voice on. And I think that's pretty accurate. It's, it's very difficult. We're, we're using the same equipment, you know, and the world looks the way it does. And, you know, so unless you really start getting in there and mucking it up, um, you know, with process or something like that, it's very difficult to have your voice emerge. Um, but of course, with new topographics, part of the idea was removing that voice in some ways. Yeah, and, and so there's just a goofy kind of thing that goes on with it. I mean, again, I'd, I'm not dogmatic about my approach to making the photographs. Like, I have no problem manipulating something or, you know, doing, I, I don't look at it as this pure kind of thing, like, oh, I can't crop it or I can't, you know, you know, change those things because I already think the photograph itself is just, it's not, it's, I still like it to have a connection to reality, but I'm not concerned with, like, well, how far? I, I'm not a journalist, you know. Um, I don't mind hmm. tweaking things. On the other hand, although obviously you're not a journalist, to me, um, these photographs photographs have a kind of forensic quality. Oh, sure. I mean, it's interesting, um, Bart, that, that you felt that the women's spirits were in some way liberated through the dissolution of the pornographic image, which, mm -hmm. which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, but on the other hand, they, they kind of resemble like drowned bodies mm -hmm. because the, um, their bodies are even more distorted, not just their breasts, but their lips mm -hmm. and, and the rest of their bodies um, by the action of the moisture in this packet. Mm -hmm. Um, so that kind of adds a layer for me. Oh yeah, and, and I mean, for me, you know, you, you talk about drowning and I felt like they were frozen, mm -hmm. you know, so there was this feeling for me of them definitely being trapped. And like I said, I think before, and I don't want to be too light. I mean, it's easy to be kind of cheeky about the, the subject matter because it, it is, it's like, oh my God, the, you know, breast fetish pornography, like what are we going to, you know. Um, uh, but the fact of the matter is that I've never made, I've never been in a place where I've made pictures where I've been so kind of, I, and this sounds corny too, I can't believe I'm saying this, like haunted, you know, like it felt like, this was a place that, you know, for back, lack of a better word, like just had bad energy. I mean, it was just like, you know, you're being mauled by mosquitoes. There's, it's, it smells. People had horrible things happen to them there. And it felt that way when I was there. Um, and, and, you know, it was also how I knew I was like, oh, okay, this is this is a place that I need to deal with, you know, in the project. Well, you're also an archaeologist. I mean, it's a little bit like these people who stumbled in Switzerland mm -hmm. on that guy who laid it just perfectly preserved and pickled for mm -hmm. fifteen thousand years, and there's even evidence of how he met his end. Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember if he was struck by a stone or an arrow or something like that. But there's a, there's an astonishment about that that um, it, it rocks you back on your heels a little bit. Oh sure. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, uh, would we could like, would anyone like to make any final comment? Just because um, we should, we could keep going for a while if you want, but we should probably wrap it up in the next five or five minutes or so. Um, so, I'm just yeah. curious about how those the imagery slipped into being labeled as pornography when it's like the female form is automatically bare. It's lab labeled pornography, and it seemed more humoristic to me when I was looking, looking at, at it. it. And, yeah, and so what? Did, what did, how, is it just the vast quantity of it that seemed to be labeled as pornography? Or? I, I think because for me, the, I mean, and I, I think the pictures, their, their intent was to fulfill somebody's desire on a, on a sexual level um, that made it pornographic. I mean, that's like one of those charge terms, too, where it's like, you know, what, where, what, you know, where, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and they're not even naked half the time there. Well, a lot, a lot of it is like our crumb in a certain way. I mean, it's got, you know, which has also sometimes been called pornography by some, uh, very high art by yeah. others like Robert Hughes. Right, but I think there's definitely a, somebody has sequestered this stuff there in, in a way that implies some kind of social, you know, uh, Taboo nature. I mean, I say that's one of the principal ones as well. Yeah. I mean, I do agree with you. I mean, it's funny to to put those two together. Like you see humor in the images, and maybe like an agency for the for the subjects, right? Of the images in a well, sense, they, or yeah. and then you see this the stranding aspect and and that. But that I don't know where I locate well, myself. Well, I, now, but, I mean, yeah. again, that for me, there is an ambiguity there about how to read them that was why I chose the images I chose to photograph. Some of them, I mean, there were some that were really explicit and there were others that were just like, you know, like here's a pair of watermelons, like ha ha ha, you know. Um, so I, I specifically, I can't believe this is being videotaped. <laughs> <laughs> But you mean actually literally watermelons, right? I mean, you know yeah, saying, yeah, yeah. I mean actual watermelons, not. Oh, this is Lord. Not oh, yeah. Uh, wow. Um, right. So, so uh, you know, I want there to be this kind of like, yeah. Where do I place these? How do I think about these? And there is an aspect. I mean, there are points in the you know when I show people the portfolio and they're going through. There's points where that you can tell they're like, I don't know if horrified is the right word, but they're they're like, and then there's other points where there's like this recognition and there's like a smirk that emerges on their face, you know. So there's, I mean, they they function in a very strange way, um, you know, um, and that was part of my intrigue in in them, I think. Well, it's almost like the I'm sorry. It's yeah. almost like the one sort of human element, or the the aspect of you know immediate human, um, just you know just the discarding of the pictures, or kind of a, a human reaction, or a human response, or a human essence, you know, in in the in that place, yeah, yeah. in a sense that you've and but you've really documented it in a really interesting way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. You know, there are these things where, I mean, you know, you, you stumble, you, you find something and you know, okay, this is, you know. And photography is, it is this process of, I mean, there, there are different ways to approach it, you know, since I'm not staging pictures, although I'm certainly not opposed to that. Um, uh, uh, there is an aspect of trying, you're going out and searching for meaning in the surface of things and places and and when you find something that f fits the bill it's pretty exciting mm -hmm. it is really interesting the way you talk about that moment as being so so fraught with with an almost gothic energy yeah um, <laughs> it's, it's like is that it's weird because i i'm not i'm not that kind of person at all and it was <laughs> though it's true it's true well because you were looking at topography and landscape, and of course, the female body is often a um, an analogous figure to the landscape. But but it was impossible for 
you or probably any of us to, re to retain that stance of objectivity um, mm -hmm. given the social implications of the packet. Mm -hmm. That's nice to know, <clears throat> for whatever reason I can't put my finger on, for some reason that these are still there and they're disintegrating. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they're going to be gone. And for, and they're not, but maybe not really, because maybe the other prints and negatives are out there. Maybe even the women are out there doing, still doing this, because I don't know all these things. Are, I, I mean, yeah. These ones have got to go. There's something weird about it. <laughs> just like imagining them finally just being mm -hmm. more or less invisible, even if they're still in the yeah, plastic. Yeah, in the package, so. yeah. And, and I'm sure the package has been more compromised now, so it's, yeah, it will be. <laughs> Less time. Are you going to go back more. up there and verify that? Everything? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I might go back up there, but I don't know if I'll go seek that that out again. <laughs> well, if you ever find yourself in Manitoba, there's... <laughs> you can just do. drive to this place. I mean, there's not a lot of roads up there, and uh, it's, it's there. And we should thank everybody for coming, and also thank yeah, Justin for, for a great talk. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah.